Let me go ahead and get us started again. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being with us. This dialogue is convened under the auspices of the Resilience Roadmap Project, it's hosted by Duke University, uh, together with the Center for American Progress, the Clio Institute, and Resilience 21. The aim of the Roadmap Project is to strengthen and accelerate national efforts to build climate resilience, and through those efforts to advance environmental justice and equity. So that's what we'll explore today, how our country can move forward with a climate resilience agenda that places racial and economic and environmental justice at its core. Let me introduce our speakers. Uh, knowing that our, our friends in government uh, could get pulled away on another very, very busy and big day, uh, let me introduce them first, and then our civil society leaders who will join me in this conversation. First, we're joined by David Hayes. He's special assistant to the president for climate policy. He's a senior member of the National Climate Advisors team, so Gina McCarthy's team, uh, which is working to advance the administration's climate conservation and clean energy priorities. We're also joined by Candace Valsing. She's program associate director for climate, energy, environment, and science at the White House Office of Management and Budget, or OMB. And finally, uh, amongst administration officials who have joined us uh, here at the top of the session, Mark Chambers, uh, who is Senior Director for Building Emissions and Community Resilience at the Council on Environmental Quality. Mark leads the administration's climate policy development for the built environment, specifically as part of the larger uh, whole of government approach to climate, to climate action. We have a few more uh, White House officials we expect to join us midway, uh, so I will introduce them as they do so, uh, and we'll get them right into the conversation. But I also want to introduce a few civil society leaders who are at the forefront of this important movement that draws us together in dialogue today. First, Dr. Beverly Wright, who is an environmental justice scholar and advocate and civic leader. She's a professor of sociology. She wears many hats. Beverly is the founder and executive director of the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice. And in connection to the administration and the ground we'll explore uh, in just a few minutes, Beverly is also a member of the White House's Environmental Justice Advisory Council and chair of the Justice 40 Initiative. If you're not already familiar with it, you'll hear more in just a little bit. And finally, uh, we're joined by Yoka Arditi Rocha, who is executive director of the Clio Institute in Florida, which works with policymakers and, and other stakeholders to build climate resilience and mobilize climate action for a just, safe, and healthy environment for all. She's a steering committee member of both the Resilience Roadmap and Resilience 21. Welcome everyone, welcome to all of our speakers. Here's how we'll proceed for the first uh, roughly hour, maybe a little under an hour, we will have, we'll hear brief remarks from uh, the White House officials who have joined us. And Yoka, Beverly and I will put a few questions to them, to each of them to get us started. For roughly the final uh, 30 minutes, we'll have a discussion in the round and we'll dig a little deeper into a few of the key topics uh, that bring us together today. I want to say to all of you who have joined us, we uh, worked hard, thanks to the entire team that produced this, sponsoring organizations, everyone who worked hard to take in uh, questions from you when you registered um, and try to incorporate them as much as possible into the, into the conversation that we'll have. So thank you all who submitted questions. Let me make just a few very, very brief informational points up top, and then we'll turn to our first speaker. As we all know, building climate resilience uh, in our infrastructure and our economy and doing so in a way that um, supports equity and justice and places it at the center uh, in our communities. These are urgent national priorities. To make progress on them, we have to turn the tide against environmental injustice and build equitable, healthy, and climate resilient communities. Now, for the administration's part, uh, President Biden's climate executive order issued in his very first week framed the administration's resilience agenda. In that same first week, he issued a companion executive order, uh, I think is very appropriate to spotlight here as well, and that is the racial equity executive order. Both were issued right away soon after uh, the president and vice president 
took office. So what's happened since then? Well, under executive authority, the administration's progress has included interagency working groups. I'm sure you'll hear more about them uh, as the conversation unfolds. Agency adaptation plans, so how the federal agencies themselves need to adapt their operations and programs to be climate ready, uh, as well as additional whole of government guidance, getting into more specifics, such as the climate related financial risk executive order and a truly historic, a groundbreaking Justice 40 initiative, namely to deliver 40% of uh, all infrastructure and climate investment benefits to disadvantaged communities. So, those all have happened over the last roughly nine months under executive authority. What about the Congress? There are two major bills pending. One is a bipartisan infrastructure package. The other is a Build Back Better package being negotiated under so-called reconciliation rules. Both are still pending, uh, but they promise to be the largest ever action taken to invest in resilient infrastructure, reduce and clean up pollution in communities, and curb greenhouse gas emissions, while also addressing important aspects of social resilience, like affordable access to childcare for families and expanded access to affordable healthcare and more. Just this morning, the White House released a framework in the form of a fact sheet for the Build Back Better package, reflecting the latest negotiations that's available on the White House website. Uh, and I know we'll hear more about that, especially from our, from our White House speakers. Thanks to the administration. Thank you to all the White House officials who have joined us already for your commitment. We would be remiss not to spotlight the importance of this package that is pending and to ask on behalf of the larger movement that the administration continue its strong support for uh, a bold resilience package uh, in this larger uh, legislation with climate and environmental justice and investments um, to really, really accelerate the progress that we need. And we are all ready, I know, to roll up sleeves and to work with you to, to get that done and to implement. Today's conversation will not only be uh, an exchange of views, but we will want to actively explore opportunities to take action together. That's very much the spirit of this. So without further ado, um, I want to welcome again and hand it over to David Hayes to offer a few remarks. David? Thank you, Zab. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks to the Resilience Roadmap Project and Duke for putting this on. Um, I just want to make a few opening remarks, um, starting with the fact this president has made climate one of his four top priorities. Uh, he made this clear on the campaign trail and as soon as he became president. The important point, though, is that climate is intertwined with the other three major priorities of the president, the economy, health, and equity. They're all one ball of wax. And if you want to question whether that's the case or not, take a look at the way the president has framed the climate issue. He's recognized that climate shoots through all of these issues. And he created a new architecture for, the pre for the, this administration, his administration, to take on the challenge in a way that cannot leave equity behind, cannot leave ec uh, economic opportunity behind, cannot leave, leave public health behind. And he did it by creating a National Climate Task Force in Executive Order 14,008 that set up, uh, that, 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 that is a new organization, a new architecture led by Gina McCarthy, the National Climate Advisor, speaking to this cabinet level group, the National Climate Task Force. And the charge to the task force is to have the organization and deployment of a government-wide approach to combat the climate crisis. There's specific mention in the executive order of increasing resilience to the impacts of climate change. And that's what this group is all about. That same paragraph though says, it's gonna be done in a way that protects public health, that delivers environmental justice, that spurs well-paying union jobs and economic growth. That's the charge. It's not easy. There's a new architecture in, in, in place. So how, how is that being implemented now uh, as we're several months in? 
Um, the executive order, again, framed this out for us. It suggested first that the federal government better get, to get its act together in two important ways. First of all, every federal agency should take on resilience uh, as a priority and, and ensure that in its footprint and in its mission area, it is addressing resilience. A couple of weeks ago, more than 20 of the major federal agencies came out with their climate resilience plans that were called for by the executive order. I encourage you to take a look at them. Some of them are truly astounding. Department of Defense, for example, the approach it's taken to climate, recognizing how integral it is to act to national security. Uh, secondly, the uh, federal government was directed through the executive order to do a better job of getting actionable climate information down to the community level to taking advantage of the data and analysis the federal government has to help communities understand what's happening uh, with climate impacts that are hitting those communities now. Again, a couple of weeks ago, we had a couple of major reports come out from FEMA, from the Office of Science and Technology Policy here at the White House, and from NOAA, along with the Federal Geographic Data Committee to, to uh, bolster those, those plans. And then thirdly, as, as uh, Saab mentioned, we're, we've got a new interagency working group concept that reports right into the cabinet level National Climate Task Force. We've created new interagency working groups to force the agencies together in a whole of government way to deal with five major climate impacts that are hitting communities hard today. They include drought, wildfire, extreme heat, coastal impacts, and flood. So what's our, what's our initial observation of how this architecture is playing out? Uh, I have three. Uh, first, this new, from the federal level, this, this new mashing together of agencies to deal with this terrifically difficult problem is working. There's a recognition when it comes to climate that no one agency controls it, that the agencies need each other. And I'll give one quick example. When it comes for, to coastal resilience, for example, we have big funding agencies like FEMA and like HUD giving out huge grants, but realizing that they don't have the science capability in-house to make the best grants or to help guide communities toward making the best grants. So they love syncing up with NOAA and USBS and the other eight science agencies that can help them help the communities that need the help. Second observation is we have money. We have money because this is a presidential priority first. And you're gonna hear from Candace Felsing shortly at OMB who's been a champion uh, in the, uh, for the agency budgets to make sure there's money for resilience. We also have legal changes. Uh, the, the, the new BRIC program at FEMA that came into, into place just a couple of years ago and that takes 6% of all the money that is spent on response and sets it aside for resilience. We had an announcement in, in, in August of $5 billion for resilience work based on, on, on this program alone. And then we have, as I've mentioned, the prospect of knock on wood, as the president announced this morning, of both the bipartisan framework coming into play and the president's Build Back Better program, which together will make flow tens of billions of additional dollars in resilience. There's bipartisan support for resilience. There's a recognition that climate impacts are killing people and are devastating communities and need to be addressed. So that's the second uh, observation, there's money. The third and final observation is really the biggest challenge that we have, which is getting the money and the information into the right hands for people to spend it in the best way 
in projects that are going to help people. Um, the feds can do part of that. And we're trying to improve the processes, which, which are frankly need improvement, uh, to enable communities to understand what resources are available, to provide the wherewithal for them to apply for and get this money, uh, and to enable them to spend it wisely. OMB, again, Candace, has been very helpful in, in early BRIC funding to ensure that when the funding requests go out, there are opportunities in particular to make sure disadvantaged communities get a fair share here. This is where we're going to need your help. All of you who are advocates in this area are gonna, there's an opportunity to do this in the right way, to take advantage of the funds that are going to be available to help the communities that most need it. But these communities also are the ones who are typically not used to making applications for grants like this and following through. And I, 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 I welcome, the, I know we all do, the work of this project and the work of all of you individually to, to take advantage of this moment in time because lives are at stake and economic welfare and equity is at stake. Thank you. David, thank you so much. Well, we appreciate your covering so much ground so quickly and appreciate the, the call to partner and the call to action and spotlighting specific things. I know we're going to dig deeper into them in, in, in the conversation here. I want uh, to respect everybody's time. So I'm going to go ahead and turn to Candace. And as I do, um, let me just say that one of the things we'd love to hear from you guys, whether in your upfront remarks or, or in the follow-up questions, is uh, give us a preview to the extent you can, too, what you see as some of the most un important unfinished business in terms of the work the administration is doing on the inside to get organized, to have a, a full and robust team, put together a strategy that kind of connects the dots. People get confused when they hear you know, a million different programs. Uh, we feel like we need a national strategy. But Candace, uh, with, with that, over to you and welcome. Thank you, and uh, thank you, David, for those comments earlier. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and discuss how we can better support communities to adapt and become more resilient to climate change, and specifically the approach that we are taking on federal spending and on equity, as David noted. Uh, if this year has shown us anything, it's that climate change poses an ongoing urgent risk to communities, our economy, and the lives and livelihoods of everyday Americans. This year alone, extreme weather has upended the U.S. economy and affected uh, one in three Americans. Wildfires have burned nearly six million acres of land, impacted our supply chains, and over the past five years, wildfires, floods, extreme heat, and other weather events have cost nearly $600 billion. So the president has made it clear, as David said, that chronic underinvestment and adaptation and resilience is not acceptable. It's harmed uh, American infrastructure, disrupted services, made travel conditions unsafe, and caused severe damage. And in so many communities across the country, like those that felt the fury of the recent storms and wildfires uh, and the impact of drought, people know the urgency of uh, what we need to do here. So the need is not just to recover, but to build smarter and stronger. And part of this means it is critical to not just get the resources to get additional resources investments to communities, but also to break down silos within government, as you noted, and to support on the ground action in communities that are most often impacted by climate change um, uh, and left behind in the recovery process. So I'll briefly discuss four examples of ways that we are investing in resilience across the government today. And then happy to answer what questions afterwards. So, as I hope you all have seen today, we uh, released a Build Back Better framework that includes 105 billion investments and incentives to extreme weather uh, from wildfires, drought, hurricanes, legacy pollution in communities, and other efforts that builds on top of the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which included. Uh, 50 billion dollars in investments for resilience so definitely putting our our money where our mouth is in terms of uh, the priority of uh, climate resilience here um, in our fy21 continuing resolution we included several billions in funding to deliver necessary steps to states and tribes to recover from uh, the, the past year's events of extreme weather and disaster this included emergency assistance to help states recover from the hurricanes, provisions to support farmers grappling with crop loss and provisions to support water conservation and water infrastructure in the West. In our FY22 budget, which I am uh, particularly proud of, um, 
We had the largest increase in funding for climate and environmental justice. It included an increase of $14 billion uh, for, uh, for those topics. And a lot of that was for resilience. And I know people tend to focus on, on BRIC a lot, uh, but there really are a lot of great programs across our whole government approach here, um, whether at USDA and Interior, at HUD, at FEMA, as you've noted. And so we really are leaning in in our budgeting and spending and taking a whole government approach to, to climate resilience. And then finally, um, which I'm happy to talk more about if folks are interested, uh, the president created Justice 40 Initiative, which is a whole government approach to environmental justice. This is something he ran on in the campaign, was in our week one executive order, and then we released initial guidance on uh, this summer. So we are definitely um, moving quickly and swiftly to, uh, to implement this. Uh, we know that the truth is, while climate change impacts all of us, the risks are, are not equally shared, and that uh, climate change exacerbates existing health and so socioeconomic inequities, placing children, the elderly, or the poor, the vulnerable, and communities of color at risk. So the, what the Justice 40 initiative aims to do is address longstanding environmental inequities and federal investments by ensuring that 40% of the benefits of climate and clean energy investments are directed to disadvantaged communities, in particular, um, the ones most disproportionately impacted. So while we have a, a lot of work ahead of us, as you noted earlier, responding to the risk uh, that climate change poses to all of us is a defining challenge of our time, but we're eager and ready to take that on and hope that we've demonstrated that it's a high priority to us and um, we're happy to work together with this group uh, to advance this cause. Candice, thank you so much. Folks have dropped some helpful links into the chat and indeed some of the um, leaders who served on the advisory council or in other ways helped to shape justice for you are with us in this event today. So it's great to have them and, and great to hear this, um, this all made concrete by you and by David. Uh, we have a few more guests joining us in a moment, but I want to ask, um, I want to ask Yoka to go ahead and, and put a question to uh, Candace. Thank you, Sav. Uh, and thank you all. I'm honored for the invitation and to be here representing Florida and my community in Miami, which many of you know as ground zero for the climate emergency. 25 of the most vulnerable cities in the U.S. for coastal flood flo flooding it's, are here in Florida. And nearly half million Floridians live less than three feet above current sea levels. Miami is also the world's most vulnerable coastal city to sea level rise. 37% of our residents are asset limited and income constrained and 17% live in poverty. This means that more than half of our population do not have the safety net to cope with the impact of a warming climate. And to top it all that, um, we have a problem with our septic system, which experts estimate that can cost more than $3 billion and half of our population is on septic tanks. Now I would be remiss if I didn't say that this administration inherit a dysfunctional system and that today's open conversation is much welcome considering the colossal task ahead. And today what the White House released is truly unprecedented, an unprecedented moment. But I must also reiterate that to build back better, the federal government cannot leave behind communities like my own. And to be able to build at all, we must curve our heat trapping warming pollution. Now local communities and in our region have largely advanced climate resilience initiatives on their own backs raising fees and taxes in order to finance projects. The price tag to adapt to the significant climate risk our communities are facing is truly enormous. FEMA's BRIC program, which you mentioned, both of you did, is one of those core vehicles that we have been using to support pre-disaster resilience building. While the increase in funding this year is an important step, only a very small fraction of these communities really received that funding. Only 22 projects in only 10 states and none of them in Florida. Many of those so, represent Yoka, a minor fraction. Yeah. I, I apologize for interjecting. I really apologize. I, I just want to acknowledge that Council on Environmental Quality Chair Brenda Mallory has joined us. Brenda, thank you for joining us. We are aware you can only be with us for a little bit. Yoka is about to put a question. We'll hear a quick uh, reply from Candace, and then we'll turn to you for remarks. Thank, thank you, you so much. Welcome, welcome. Um, so I'll get to the point. How will OMB track and monitor federal investments in climate resilience and justice for you to ensure that they really deliver real economic and public health benefits to our communities with the greatest need? Making sure that the cost benefit analysis used to evaluate these programs 
do not result in inequitable outcomes in direct contradiction with Justice 40's goal. Thank you for your comments and um, for the, your, your work that you've done on the ground and uh, appreciate you joining us today. So I'll try to be brief here so that we can have Brenda and other people speak. Um, great question. It's a, a great effort that we've gone to here at OMB to be able to set up a robust system uh, to answer your question. So uh, first thing to note is this is a work in progress. As we noted, it's a new initiative. Um, we released uh, interim guidance this summer uh, you know, working with the agencies right now. So as part of the Justice 40 initiative, agencies are currently reviewing all their programs to, to determine which ones are covered. Um, the most interesting part of the guidance I think that we released was we had a, a pilot programs where we uh, worked with about seven or eight agencies to identify 20 programs to really figure out how to do what you're saying. You know, where we know that, that some of those programs are doing great in investing in disadvantaged communities and ensuring the benefits are going to disadvantaged communities, but some of them need a little bit of work. And we acknowledge that. So what we asked the agencies to do was to go and to think hard about how they could use their administrative action, whether that's, uh, you know, providing a bonus to disadvantaged communities in the grants or priorities to who gets the type of grant funding or loan funding, just thinking of ways different, I think we listed 10 different ways that agencies could consider providing incentives to ensure that the funding is directed towards the communities that need the most. Uh, and then of course, other thinking, uh, thinking creatively. In addition, we asked them to identify legislative changes because we know we only have so much power here in the administrative um, uh, part of the government and we need Congress to act too. But two of the programs that we uh, that we uh, that were included in the pilot programs were the BRIC framework and also the flood mitigation systems in FEMA. And so we are actively right now working with the agencies uh, to identify how to do what you just said to really move the bar and figure out how they can better invest in disadvantaged communities. So we're I appreciate you bringing this up. We're very aware that this is an issue that that needs work. We as David noted earlier. Um, uh, in the funding that came out, this uh, uh, announcement that came out this summer, we actually took action to uh, be able to correct for some of the the uh, previous concerns that you just noted. Um, but but we are appreciate your question. We are actively working with agencies to figure out the best way to move the ball here, and then we are also working on a tracking and reporting system because we know what we do or need to do for Justice 40 is show transparency and be accountable. And so we are working on a scorecard, which will likely come out at the beginning of next year timeframe, um, which we'll be able to share with, with folks across the community um, about how we're going about implementing Justice 40 so that we can keep iterating on this process and improving because we really do want to get it right. Candice, thank you so much. Need to stop you there. Appreciate it. again covering a lot of ground very quickly, and thanks to Yoka for the question. I want to turn thank now you. to Brenda Mallory and welcome her. She's chair of the Council on Environmental Quality. Brenda, can you hear me? I can. Thank you so much, uh, uh, and I really appreciate being invited to join this event, which uh, looks like a great agenda. I caught a very little bit of what David had to say. I think we have some overlap, so I'll try to cut down on some things um, that he's already addressed, but I, um, I really appreciate being here. Um, I think the work that this, this uh, panel or this program is trying to um, focus on is really an important part of our figuring out how we can work with and uh, assist communities and on the climate resilience uh, efforts. Uh, last week in Scranton, Pennsylvania, President Biden said that his policy goals will always focus on expanding opportunity. And that's exactly what we're working toward at CEQ. That is, that is a, a goal that um, we share with him as we try to figure out how we can be um, and ensure that the programs of the federal government are more inclusive and more just as we look at resilience uh, issues, but also just look more broadly at uh, climate change and how um, and how uh, it is in both impacting people and how we address it. Um, as part of the early executive order 14008, the president made clear that we would tackle the ongoing climate crisis through the all of government approach with both, which both David and Candace uh, have mentioned, uh, and it certainly prioritizes resilience as an important component of our ongoing efforts. 
David outlined the um, interagency working groups that have just recently been set up. And, and also, I think, just pointed to the fact that it's obvious why we chose the ones that we did. Um, while there is clearly an interrelationship and an intersection between all of those areas, I do feel like we um, recognize that actually drilling down and seeing some of the unique differences in the way heat, for example, is impacting communities as compared to drought, like that's going to really be important in terms of our being able to address what are the real on the ground impacts that people are experiencing and how do we uh, adjust our programs, adjust our interaction in a way that is responsive to that. So, you know, whether it's, you know, devastating wildfires in the West or deadly, you know, heat extreme that's gripped our much of the country last summer, you know, every community across the country is feeling, uh, feeling the impacts. And so we've got to recognize how these impacts are disproportionately impacting low income communities and communities of color. There's much evident evidence on that. Um, one of the reasons that I think equity and environmental justice have, have been so much a, a kind of center of how we think about and talk about uh, the work in this area, the work in climate, in the climate change in general, is just because of those impacts. And also just recognizing that if we're really going to actually try to rebuild, um, uh, you know, rebuild with a clean energy economy as a key component of that, that this, this effort will, it will be important that we are bringing everyone along, that we are uh, responding to not only historic um, uh, injustices, but also just making sure that we're not re kind of in some ways rebuilding and reinforcing some of the same problems that we've already created. Um, so Candace just referred to the Justice 40 initiative, obviously very important in the work that we're doing in CEQ in partnership with OMB, but she talked about the 21 pilot proje uh, projects that are important. She specifically mentioned the BRIC program. Um, I was going to give one example um, of the, uh, the funding that uh, went out recently that is a good example of how the program works. Um, in uh, Duck, North Carolina, there was an elevation project um, that will improve resilience efforts for in individuals living in on the coastlines. Um, the project will incorporate um, a living revetment, including wetland restoration to prevent erosion, protect the roadway and adjacent properties, um, and help uh, attenuate kind of wave energy. In Frankfort, Kentucky, there were funds that will go to a flood and sanitary pump. Uh, this project will rehabilitate the flood pump station um, with new pumps and electrical uh, systems that are intended to function for the next 50 years. Uh, these actions will help to make Frankfurt more resilient to intense storm events and will prevent uh, water pollution and debris, um, debris buildup. So we, I, we do see brick as being important, but I do think Kansas made a good point in, in identifying the fact that there are, are other programs that are also getting, um, uh, getting attention and getting that focus on how we ensure that the benefits that we're trying uh, to make, you know, make sure are, are distributed are, are reaching everyone. Um, I think all of these programs kind of will allow uh, allow communities across uh, the, the country um, to both receive the benefits, but also help us to make sure that we're uh, hearing, listening to, uh, getting the input from people who have experienced these programs and have a real sense of where some of the, the hurdles have been and how we can address those. I'll just give one quick example before closing. Um, I was just recently in, um, Detroit, uh, and one of the stops in Detroit was uh, with a community of folks who had experienced a really in, uh, intense flooding in the recent weeks. And we ended up talking to a woman in particular who clearly was a community leader, uh, just about the, the challenges with going through the, the mechanics of even filing uh, under programs, you know, what, what that took, what that means for communities where they may not be um, uh, as uh, you know, 
familiar with using the computer or have computer access if there's flooding you know some of the people kind of also lost power and so having systems that are set up that don't recognize kind of the circumstances that people are having to try to operate in is an issue and the other thing is just recognizing that certain populations and this was a woman who uh, was elderly although i think she was my age um, and her uh, and her community and others who had health challenges just that asking that population to go through some of the process that is our norm is a great example of something that we really have to address if we're going to make sure that uh, that everybody gets the benefits. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to you. And uh, thanks again for inviting me to join you. Brenda, thank you so much. And while we respect all of your offices, we're on a first name basis today. Hope that's OK. We are all, uh, in some sense, public servants and community servants. So thank you. We'll, we'll keep it informal. I want to turn to uh, Beverly, founder of the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, who has a question for you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Brenda. And you can call me. Hello. Beverly. I was going to say hello, Dr. Wright. <laughs> that really is just fine. Um, so I want to say good afternoon to everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, to discuss these issues because I believe in my 30 years of working, this is the first time that I really see some momentum that I think can bring about change if we can get it to work. But I wanted to just make a few comments that relates to the work that we're doing. <clears throat> and it's scripted because I'm long-winded. So, <laughs> so in partnership with HBCUs, my organization works in collaboration with communities who have identified air pollution and flood risk as urgent priority concerns. They want to change. For years, the data show that air pollution and flood risk are not evenly distributed in America. Black people are 79 times more likely than whites to live in neighborhoods where per permitted industrial pollution poses the greatest health danger. <clears throat> Additionally, studies show that flood risk management is rife with racial inequity. In the 1990s, the White House Council on Environmental Quality developed critically important guidance under the National Environmental Policy Act for implementing environmental justice to assess the impacts of proposed federal projects. Under your leadership, can we count on the CEQ to build on this environmental justice guidance with new guidance for governmental agencies to implement environmental justice and air permit decisions and flood risk management decisions. And I apologize, my voice is not cooperating. That's quite all right. I understood what you were saying uh, and I appreciate that. I can't say that I am um, um, as, you know, I know that the guidance exists. I'm not familiar exactly what's in it, but I think in some ways, it is absolutely clear that we, uh, and I in particular, are, are focused on how we help ensure that the president's overall goals, not just on Justice 40, but in, on environmental justice in general, are, um, are made a reality. And so the tool, whether the tool of additional guidance or guidance on top of that particular guidance that you um, are referring to um, I don't think we've decided that, but we know that we have to figure out like what are the best mechanisms to make sure that the, the agencies both understand and have within their own systems the um, ability to try to carry out the goals. Uh, uh, so, for example, during through the, um, the White House Environmental Justice Interagency Council, um, which we're using really as a key um, um, means of staying in touch with the agencies about the work that they're doing and like how it is, uh, that both the issues that are coming up in it, but, but also how, um, what their success looks like. I think that's a, a vehicle for trying to figure out like what's, what do they need? Like what's the best tool? Is that tool more guidance? And maybe it is, and if it is, and we'll add that, or is there something else that would be more beneficial either in form of training that we could do both for one agency or multiple agencies or you know other mechanisms so i guess my my um 
I guess my general statement to you is we are committed to figuring out how to make this work. And if that the way to do that is more is some specific guidance, then I think we're definitely um, committed to sort of pursuing that. But if there are other tools, I don't want to uh, sort of suggest that we're taking one approach when we're still assessing what would be the best. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. I, I think I'm just hoping that, and I think you answered my question, that you're looking to be creative and, you know, analyzing the situation on the ground to determine why we've not had any movement. It means we have to do something a little bit different and make changes. And I appreciate your response. Thank you. Thank you. Beverly, thank you. Brenda, thank you. We know you, you need to scoot. Um, we appreciate you and we appreciate your, your joining us. I, I want, before we lose him, to uh, also put a question um, to, to David, and then I will turn to Mark. David, I didn't get a chance to ask you a question right up top. Uh, we were sort of racing along there. Um, what do you see as some of the most important to-dos let's say over the next three to six months, as the administration builds on the really exciting things you shared with us already, what would you like to see happen to make sure you can really hit the ground running next year and work in partnership with all of us? Uh, great question, Zab. I, 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 I would like to see how the community that is on this call can help us develop uh, good ways of communicating with leaders at the local level, the tribal level, the state level, um, so that we get a dialogue going back and forth. Uh, you know, we, we're going to need feedback uh, on what we're doing well, what we're not doing well. And I think in general, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, not great history here in terms of the relationship between the federal government and local communities. Uh, and so uh, I, I'd love to see, and, and I, I really respect what the project is trying to do in this regard, uh, a way to make our federalism uh, structure work well, uh, particularly here as we're gearing up, I hope to spend a whole lot more money uh, and we need to do it well and, and also get the expectations right, et cetera. So I think there's a, there's a missing piece of architecture here. Uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job on the federal level. I'm not going to overstate how well we're doing it because it's not got a lot of history, but we're we're launched and we see a pathway. But but how we how we complement that with the relationship with community leaders, community officials, et cetera, is is the big the big thing I'd love to make progress on with the help of folks on this call over the coming months. David, thank you. Well, we look forward to working with you on that. I'm, I'm hearing you say the feedback and learning infrastructure, not to be confused with the physical infrastructure itself, of course, but the regular mechanisms to learn together and to get feedback in as close to real time as you can and as we work at this, because we're all learning. And, and, and these institutions are all going to be stretching. Um, re really appreciate that. Thank you. I, I want to turn to Mark and make sure he has a chance to, to share some thoughts with us as well. Mark, over to you, sir. All right, make sure everyone can hear me. All good. Oh, great, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, thanks Dad, for having us. Thanks, of course, to, to David and Chair Mallory um, for all of your kind of insightful comments. And you know, thanks to everyone here for all of the work that's going on um, and for being here for the dedication to this work in this space. I think it's important for all of us to continually emphasize the the fierce urgency of, of the work that's in, that's in front of us. And I think that's why we're all here and why the, you know, the president's climate agenda is so ambitious and uh, the scale is so critical to our path forward. I mean, I just can't be more thrilled than I am, you know, today to be um, working on behalf of the president when, you know, again, we're having, is a day where there's a conversation happening about investing, you know, $555 billion in climate. Like that's a, that's a real, um, it's a real investment. And so, for me to be able to be doing this work to help decarbonize our built environment and create a healthier communities is really um, is really an honor. You know, every day, as is, is all of you know, we are confronted more and more with the uh, the kind of tangible and experiential evidence that our climate is changing very rapidly, right? And so our approach to this work has to be equally as dynamic 
And that's why you see so many different people from different parts of the, the White House, the administration working on this from different angles. You know, I predominantly work on buildings. You know, how do we build them better? How do we make buildings, you know, existing buildings more efficient and increasingly electrified? Um, you know, how do we how do we make our buildings more resilient and adaptable and less fragile? And then, like similarly, how do we make the people inside them um, more resilient and healthier and more able to take part in this great uh, generational work that we that's in front of us to build a carbon free future. So I mean, I'm someone who's very, very passionate about like improving the physical world um, that we live in, because I feel like it's where we live. It's where we work and pray and go to school and you know raise our families. And you know, buildings have this really um, incredible responsibility to house our stories. And so I think that it's important that as we kind of think forward, we, we acknowledge that they're on the front line or one of the front lines of our, our confrontation against um, a rapidly changing climate. And, you know, but I'm not, I, I don't wanna like sugarcoat it, right? So I think that, you know, even as though there's a lot of work that's been done and we continue to make incredible strides and many of them were mentioned before, like what the work that's happening in the interagency working groups, there's CDBG funding, there's, you know, the launch of the climate change and health equity uh, office at HHS, which is incredible, the $5 billion, the, you know, FEMA mitigation grants, brick funding, all the things that a lot of people have mentioned you know, there's still, time is still not on our side for, for what we're doing, right? And so um, it's important that we kind of acknowledge that the impacts of extreme heat and wildfire and drought and, you know, flooding uh, are all very grim and unevenly distributed. So communities that often contribute the absolute least to the climate crisis are watching their lives and their history and their cultures uprooted. And so that's why it's important that we continue this whole of governor approach to really, uh, you know, center justice in, in this work and make sure that we're being as thoughtful and intentional as possible. And it helps us focus on the big picture while simultaneously addressing a lot of the like specific immediate needs that particularly impacting disadvantaged and overburdened communities. And you know, a lot of people here today, have, you've heard a lot uh, and we'll continue to hear a lot about the federal mobilization around resilience. Um, and a lot of, but a lot of the critical work um, that I'm seeing, you know, will continue to also happen at the local level. Uh, and I wanted to highlight today, like one of the kind of strongest levers that I believe um, we have for strengthening resilience in our, in our built environment, you know, whether it's state, local, regional, or tribal government, you know, are, those are building and energy codes. You know, I, I know, you know, a lot of people don't spend as much time thinking about codes as, as I do, and I love them, uh, but like modern and resilient building codes, like they help communities withstand and recover quickly from natural hazards. And that's everything from ventilation and community requirements to mold resistance to you know, elevation of electrical equipment above flood lines, you know, and all the things that also help our buildings to perform better during a building's normal useful life. And those things end up improving and like helping against energy burden and improving indoor air and like environmental quality. And also like th those are things that come from less combustion indoors, which is also important. Uh, and it also helps to provide uh, a lot of like passive strategies, but also life-saving cooling, uh, which I think is something that we're also hearing a lot more about and are, are definitely advocating for a lot more consideration. Extreme heat, as everyone knows, is a very pernicious like, serial killer. And you know, uh, to that end, we actually, um, uh, in August, we had, as part of a stakeholder series that we initiated here um, at the Council of Environmental Quality, we convened resilience leaders uh, as uh, along with uh, smart surface, like industry professionals, product manufacturers, city governments, and as well as federal um, agencies, Department of Energy and uh, EPA in particular, to uh, really kind of discuss building-based solutions for, for urban heat uh, as a justice issue. I think that was like kind of emblematic of the type of convenings that we are able to kind of bring a lot of, uh, you know, disparate entities together to be able to address some of these really critical and, and uh, and more, um, more urgent problems. And a lot of the innovation in this space is being driven by codes. You know, they're really, really important. And, you know, uh, we've been working aggressively over the last several months to update, uh, you know, federal determinations for codes and to, you know, and these are, you know, these are things that allow for local code adoption at, this, at the state and, uh, and city level. So commercial codes like ASHRAE 90.1, IECC 2021, um, uh, you know, we've also proposed like improvements to, uh, uh, the energy efficiency code updates for um, affordable manufactured housing. We've launched an initiative earlier this May to develop the first ever federal building uh, performance standards um, and are now reaching out to cities all across the country to help uh, local, uh, develop localized building performance standards as well. 
Uh, and for those that don't know, building performance standards are a very transformative policy lever uh, to address um, performance of existing buildings. Um, <clears throat> and it's like, it's something that is useful in, in cities and kind of small towns alike. And it creates an engine for a lot of the building retrofits that will make all of our communities a lot more adaptable. Uh, and you know, codes and standards, while, while very powerful, um, they're not flawless, right? So most codes are based on historic data uh, and, that, and that doesn't kind of quickly acknowledge the projected severity and frequency of uh, future storms like that work to be done, unlock potential there. But no matter where you are like participating today in this, this conversation, there's a code cycle that's underway right now in your area. And so it's important to understand like what's happening and what codes are being proposed for that to make sure that we're consistently using that as a lever to be able to increase um, the ability for these to be more resilient and then to be able to push for stretch codes and different um, uh, hazard mitigations that come along with that. And all of those things are important because they lay a foundation uh, for a lot of the proactive and really forward-looking community planning that's going to also be underway. Um, to help advance resilient communities. And all of that is what's going to be unfolding as we see a lot more investment that is flowing down to the cities. And so being able to kind of be in, in the driver's seat and be ready um, to kind of look at these unprecedented investments that the, that the president continues to champion, uh, that will be incredibly important so that we, when we directing these resources, they're able to actually meet the moment and meet you know, communities where they are, and then allow them to be able to utilize them in, in the ways in which they know best on the ground. So I'm excited to kind of continue to be a part of this and to continue to interact directly with all of you in whatever way we can to make sure that we are be, continuing this, this feedback loop of communication and transparency so that we can make sure that we are all kind of meeting this moment. Thanks. Mark, thank you so much. I um, wanna uh, put a, a quick question to you in a, in a moment. Before I do that, bear with me here. I wanna acknowledge and welcome uh, your colleague, Cecilia Martinez, who has joined us. Cecilia is the Senior Director for Environmental Justice uh, at the Council for Environmental Quality. And her role is to facilitate uh, coordination of this whole of government, uh, the environmental justice agenda specifically uh, within the Biden administration. Cecilia, welcome. Uh, we're gonna pivot to a, a conversation in, in the round now. And I'll, I'll get us started um, with a question to you, Mark, and um, invite Cecilia if she would like to comment as well and, and others uh, in the group to offer their thoughts. You, um, you underscored a, a number of key risks and the importance of not forgetting buildings and codes and performance standards. I think we all appreciate, even if we don't know the, uh, the details, all of us in the way that you do, what building professionals do, appreciate the enormous stakes associated. I also appreciate your underlining heat among the many hazards. I think we're, we're taking note as cities like Miami appoint the first ever chief heat resilience officers this country has ever had. Talk about a wake up call uh, for all of us. But here's my question. Um, one of the challenges we've seen, and it's not limited to uh, climate resilience, is that oftentimes many of the communities that need federal resources the most have limited capacity, uh, limited readiness to access them equitably uh, and or to deploy them to greatest effect. Um, and I'd like to ask you, and again, invite Cecilia if she would like to offer her thoughts as well. How does the administration plan to address this? It is such a fundamental uh, issue when it comes to delivering equity, not just espousing it. And I, I know you know what I mean. So absolutely, and um, and absolutely encourage uh, Cecilia to join the um, the conversation. I, so I think it's important for us to kind of recognize that. Um, there are a lot of different challenges and there's also a lot of things that different people are good at, right? And so being able to be really thoughtful about the fact that, you know, a lot of the work up to this point has been preparing for now, preparing to provide the resources that will go to a lot of cities and communities all across the country to be able to have the, um, the resources to engage in this work, but being able to have that technical assistance, being able to have the, um, the skills training and upskilling that will be necessary in order to actually implement a lot of these strategies, those things are gonna also require us to grow the tent. One of the things that we've also been considering in some of our engagement is having a lot of um, conversations with kind of local 
communities and local community governments where they're actually, where their services are actually meeting the populations and making sure that they are telling us what they need most of. And then also pushing those same questions to other sectors. So talking to philanthropy, what are they able to do in terms of being able to connect directly with communities in ways that uh, they can operate potentially a lot faster than maybe some of the other um, you know, wings of, of the government. And maybe, um, you know, also talking to academia, talking to the financial sector. There's a lot of different places where the key things that are going to be necessary, how do we mobilize enough people very quickly to act? And how do we make sure that they're doing so with the right amount of technical guidance? And part of that means growing the tent of who is involved and who is going to be able to utilize the resources that we've set in motion in a way to make sure that it's having most amount of impact, but also doing it as quickly as possible. Mark, thank you. Cecilia, what are your thoughts on this? What can you share with us? Sure, of course. Thank you. I think I think exactly what Mark said. And in addition to that, I think that we all recognize, I mean, there is a reason that there has been historic underinvestment and marginalization of certain communities across the country, that there are, there are sort of systems in place that for, for whatever reason, either intentionally or unintentionally, we're unable to meet the needs of communities on the ground. Um, and that's the whole intent of addressing inequality and, and, and the issues of, of climate resiliency, as well as the whole slate of other things. I think what's really unique right now um, is that we are recognizing and we know we're building into the process um, knowledge from communities themselves about what the barriers are to accessing these resources. We are encouraging agencies with respect to their Justice 40 implementation reporting and their planning to ensure that they are taking into account that, um, that they follow through the life cycle of where these programs are supposed to be, that they identify in collaboration with communities that their programs are supposed to serve, um, what the barriers are and the challenges are for getting that money. We have seen um, already many programs change um, their eligibility, their, um, their requirements for grant applications. That's one step. But we also need to build the capacity, as Mark is saying, with other sectors, with cities, with counties, with states, who may not also know or understand what the true barriers are at the community level to accessing these resources, make sure that we support community planning, make sure that those voices where these um, funds are supposed to go are actually participating in the decision-making process, making recommendations about how um, these programs are supposed to help um, solve their issues. And, you know, that's just plain good science. Um, we have to know what the reality of communities are on the ground if we're going to create programs that address their needs. And the only way to do that is to build that capacity with our partners, with philanthropy, so that those community groups that have been underserved and don't have the resources now have the resources to participate effectively in these decision-making processes. Cecilia, thank you. I, I want to invite Yoka in to share her thoughts. And Yoka, whether you, in the spirit of this dialogue, would like to uh, you know, evaluate some of the progress and plans from the administration so far, offer your experience on this question of helping communities to get ready, to build the capabilities to both access resources and, and use them well. Uh, over to you to share your thoughts. Thank you, um, and Mark and Cecilia, thank you so much for, for your interventions. I'm so excited to hear what's to come. Um, I, I mean, we know it well in Miami and thank you, Sab, for acknowledging that we just appointed our first heat chief officer. Um, we know that low-income areas and community of colors are at the epicenter of, of where heat islands and aging buildings meet. Um, we have many residents living in affordable housing that cannot run their AC. Um, because it, it really imposes them a, a energy burden and, and exposing them to really dangerous um, situations. I learned the other day a woman was fighting with her daughter, went to jail because of a fan, and when she was released, went back home and died of complications from heat illness and respiratory disease. Um, so for us, AC, it's a matter of life and death um, in many parts of the country as well. And you are an expert, Mark, on, on building envelopes and heat island. Um, and so I, I'm interested to, to, to really, uh, and I know that this is all in, in the works, but how are we gonna prioritize center obviously in justice 40 and, and, and equity 
to address these life and death situations. Um, and, 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 and how do we really ensure that we have a bottom up approach as Cecilia mentioned and, and have a more inclusive dialogue um, David mentioned, you know, wanting to have that dialogue, and there's so many stakeholders out there, like the um, League of Cities uh, and so many others that can be involved in this process. But I'm interested to hear today, you know, how can we make sure that th that inter interagency and holistic um, approach can frankly address, you know, not only our climate pollution, but not burning our, our disadvantaged and, and vulnerable communities. Sure, thank you, Yoga. I mean, I think that's that's incredibly important. And it is, I think, really where we start to see those intersection points of all of the both the kind of values that we are bringing to this, but also like the intervention points, like those things are where um, so much uh, is at stake that it's important for us to be really thoughtful and intentional about how we're pursuing them. You mentioned heat. And I think, um, you know, this time last year, um, I was working for the mayor in New York City, and we were kind of confronting the same same challenge of heat. And one of the things that we kind of see is that, you know, ultimately, you know, we put forward a process where we installed 75,000 air conditioned units in the homes of vulnerable elderly um, residents of the city um, over like a, a month long period. But that came from state money that came from federal money that came that came in a way in which we had to repurpose in, in order to do that also simultaneously we had to go and pursue um bill relief from the 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 um from the uh the the, the, the energy commission and so the point i'm trying to make is that part of that solution even though it was kind of made in real time those are the things that that needs a platform for to be replicated in a way in which communities are able to have more clarity around what options they have to be able to implement measures that will save lives. And so that's why I was so, I mentioned earlier, the creation of the, the health equity office at HHS, which I think was really, really um, important kind of intervention point of understanding where are those places where we can look at federal programs that exist, look at federal resources that are being provided, and then combine them with like prioritization around life-saving measures. And cooling has to be something that is consistently elevated to the top of the list, because again, it is absolutely without a doubt, like taking more lives than the combination of any of the other um, uh, 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 resilience-based issues that we're, we're facing. So I think it's, I think your point is spot on. And I think that we are putting the police pace, the the items in place to be able to at least maximize the impact the federal government can have. And part of the way we do that is to share examples from city to city and town to towns around the country. Mark, thank you. Yoko, I'm sorry, did you have a, a follow up comment? I saw you on mute there. I was, I, I, and I, I appreciate Mark's response. And can we just tell HUD to you know, take away the mandate for heaters for Miami and put air conditioning instead? That would be good. Noted. <laughs> like, Pro tip, a key tip. Cecilia, please. Sure. So, so let me just say, in addition to that, I think, you know, I mean, obviously, we don't know the full range of climate impacts that is across the communities. Or heat islands, urban heat is a very critical one. Um, but I think to your point, Yoko, which I think is a really important one, is that how do we begin to understand the full magnitude of yes. all the different climate impacts that are affecting a community. And, and they are, when we say climate is a threat multiplier, that's exactly yeah. what we mean. It's not only in terms of heat, it's in terms of heat and flooding, or it's not only in terms of cold snaps in the Midwest, it's in terms of cold snaps and other things. Um, and I think that's the part which really excites me about what we're doing. To your point, one of the key elements of Justice 40 is that all agencies are required to provide a community engagement plan about how they are going right. to interact and get information and engage not just state, local, tribal, and county stakeholders into the process, but also how they are going to engage community them, communities themselves, community-based organizations, their constituencies. And so that's a part of the formal process of making sure that Justice 40 gets to our most vulnerable communities, is ensuring that agencies are developing robust, effective plans to have those communities at the table so that we can get the full range 
of impacts and so that, that er, there can be interagency collaboration on health, on air quality, yeah. on, <clears throat> on coastal sea level rise, on all the dimensions of climate impacts. Cecilia, thank you so much. Thank I want to get everyone in here. Beverly, whether sticking in this vein or taking us somewhere new, there's so much to talk about. Your thoughts or, or questions? Yeah, uh, this conversation has my brain just popping. And I want to say this, um, and this is just based on personal experience. Um, because of climate change, you know, we had Katrina, which was the first of the big ones. We've had many since. But one of the results of that of that particular storm was that people began to think differently about how to build and build back better and stronger. And when Mark, when I heard you say something about codes and changing the codes and how important it was, I do remember that in New Orleans, they began to change codes. And those code changes made it impossible for some um, lower income working class people to rebuild their homes because of the expense. So it's one thing to have an idea of how to build back better in ways that we know will make us more resilient. But if the people who need it the most can't afford it, what good is it? So I just want to throw that out. I mean, while we're thinking, we need to come up with programs that support those code changes. In the city of New Orleans, we probably have more solar panel homes than any other place in the country per capita and across income lines. That was because of tax credits that were given for doing just that. But this is my official question. Uh, the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice supports communities to develop research to action and drive solutions to benefit present and future generations. In my experience, and you all have spoken to this, I've seen how governmental agencies put resources intended for communities out of their reach with hyper-technical language, restrictive criteria, and arduous and long processes that result in undermining community self-determination and excluding communities from programs that were designed for them. How will you ensure that the resilience and justice party initiatives don't have these kinds of variable barriers to community access? Senior remark, would either of you like to address that? So yes. So I have the I have the fortunate, um, really fortunate um, position of, of of knowing Dr. Wright. Um, and knowing the, how important these issues are. So, so let me just start. Absolutely, um, Dr. Wright. I think one of the things, and that's why we have been so careful in terms of structuring and asking agencies to report on their community engage, engagement plans, to be very strategic and thoughtful about what they need when they are asking communities about what is the best and most effective way to implement their programs across the board to meet the needs of the communities, because we need to hear from communities themselves what those barriers are. And the technical language, the technical orientation of much of the federal government's activities needs to be broken and down in a way that is accessible, particularly to communities that don't have that technical capacity. So that is a critical component that we are working on um, as we speak through the, through the reporting from agencies. We're also working with OSTP um, in a whole range of what does research look like um, if we are truly going to address and integrate equity, environmental justice into the whole slate of a research agenda around climate change. Um, what information and what data do we not have? What information and data is not at the level or granularity that really gives us a good understanding of what is the reality of our communities um, and where do we need to build new data and new research priorities in order to address the, exactly the kinds of things that you're talking about. Um, so at least from the EJ side of things, that is some of the work that is going on. I could speak to more, but um, absolutely, I think that's a very critical component that you've raised. 
Mark, do you have a quick follow up before I ask a new question? Sure. Just just one point I wanted to make, and I think that um, Dr. Wright made a great great points uh, earlier. I think it's just important to recognize that um, all of these things are dynamic, and it, and it's going to be important for as with the example around the building building codes is that um, making sure that we are creating an environment where those that are most effective are part of the decision making framework is part of how you quickly raise the attention where there are going to be problems with just one one approach. So being able to make sure that we are improving building energy codes, incredibly important and necessary to be able to make sure that funding and all the different pieces can move in place. But being able to have additional policies that ameliorate some of those energy burdens that come along with that is, is part of the challenge that's in, in place now. A lot of this conversation is happening around electrification, which is a, also a big conversation around how do we you know, move forward with all electric buildings and homes and so forth. And being able to do that in a way that does not increase um, overburdening populations is incredibly important as well. That only happens if there are, there are more people in the room and that we're actively creating an environment where we can center those people in the, in the conversation and elevate uh, some of those solutions that won't exacerbate other problems. Mark, thank you. I'm, I'm watching the clock here and we've got about 10 minutes before we wrap. Again, I'm grateful to all of you for um, being so generous with your time. I want to put a, just a, a few final questions on the table. I'll turn to our colleagues in government first, to offer their thoughts and, and then to Beverly and, and to Yoka. Um, one question that emerged from our participants as we organized this is, what about rural communities? You know, often feel um, left out of a conversation, for example, that, that might get framed as being about urban heat islands or population centers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what, what is the administration doing and, and what should we all do to ensure that rural communities are not left uh, out of this progress or left further behind? It's question number one. Question number two is, is very different. And again, I invite the panelists weigh in where you we're in way and where you would like. Question number two is about systemic bias. So one thing we have learned and we're in a national conversation about at last is that a given form of bias doesn't have to set out to create a disparity uh, to create a very real disparity or disproportionate impacts or exclusion. An example I wanna give that uh, came to us in organizing this is benefit cost analysis. If we think of hazard mitigation, if we think of some of the stuff that FEMA has funded over the years, uh, grounded in cost-benefit analysis that weighs property loss according to scale, well, the highest value properties and the uh, wealthiest homeowners or other property owners, excuse me, benefit disproportionately because um, their properties you know, loom larger in those traditional benefit cost analysis. So I, I don't mean to take us on a sidetrack, it's simply about that analytic tool and decision-making tool I cited as an example um, where there's bias in the system. It was you know, designed many years ago, but we can no longer afford that kind of bias. So question number one, what about rural? How do we make sure rural communities are not left behind? What must we do? And question number two, um, what is the administration doing or planning to do to really root out some of these biases that are less, uh, less visible, less understood, um, but create real problems. Let me, as promised, turn to our colleagues in the White House first to offer thoughts and, and then to you open and Beverly. Mark, you wanna start off? Sure, I'll just start off. And just to the, the point around um, engagement and kind of beyond coastal cities and, and engagement beyond um, uh, dense urban environments. While I, they, there's a lot of attention put there strictly because of the, the, um, the quantity of people, there is a, a really important um, part of Justice 40 and part of this work. And that, that has to do with, again, meeting people where they are. And, and for us, that, the way in which we're able to achieve that has a lot to do with how we structure our response and structure our interagency interaction. So um, a lot of the, the rural conditions that we are looking to, to help ameliorate are um, very well coupled with a lot of the work that um, USDA is doing versus maybe versus HUD or maybe versus Department of Energy. 
they're all at the table now in a conversation around how exactly are we maximizing the efficacy of different programs that are actually impacting different populations. And that's something that is only possible because of the way in which these interagency working groups, as well as the National Climate Task Force is set up, because without that, there was these silos that were actually not um, allowing for us to leverage the kind of best of this work in a way that um, impacts different um, parts of the country in, in the same way. And so that's one of the ways in which we are also able to kind of benefit from more interaction across the, the agencies. It also leads us to a place where we're able to utilize programs that impact different populations in a way that we haven't been able to do so before. All right, thank you. Cecilia, your final thoughts on either or both of these? Sure. Um, well, a very important place where we're ensuring that is with um, the climate and economic justice screening tool, which is the tool that will identify where the communities are for Justice 40. And obviously, um, that resource allocation tool, that tool of defining which communities would um, be part of Justice 40 is a critical, critical piece. We have been very careful to make sure that whatever indicators and what other methodology, whatever methodology we come up with, um, is going to ensure that we have rural communities well represented based on the realities of what they need um, and making sure that indicators um, follow through in terms of, um, of, of making sure that Justice 40 implementation meets where the highest needs are in this country, whether it's urban or whether it's rural, whether it's tribal or whether it's non-tribal, whether it's within the 48, lower 48, or whether it's in um, Hawaii and Alaska and the territories. So that's one thing. On the cost benefit, um, my 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 heart just jumped a little bit because what that question has been at the heart of a lot of my work throughout my life. Um, absolutely, we need to you know the intentionality, um, the sort of systemic bias, the intentional systemic bias, in some ways is easier to tackle. Not that it's easy to tackle, but it's easier to tackle, and that it's an identifiable problem. What is much harder to tackle are these are these processes and decision tools and methodologies that have been built around a systemic way of understanding the world. Cost benefit is obviously one of those. And I think one of the things that we have been in discussions with and making sure that Justice 40 in terms of the benefits methodology for the 40% investment benefits is as robust and gap captures the needs and the realities of communities. So that is a process that we are working with and we are working with agencies to make sure that they get that benefit methodology right. In addition, um, in modernizing regulatory review, there is an effort underway to continue to advance and figure out how to bring in important co-benefits, health and environmental co-benefits that more closely resemble the reality of what we need to be um, um, measuring. And so I think those two areas are going to be help us support at least a foundation for moving beyond the current decision making tools. Cecilia, thank you. Thank you. I know we all appreciate the specifics from you and Mark. Uh, four minute warning, everybody will hear from Beverly next and then Yoka. Beverly, your final thoughts. Yes, so um, Justice 40 is for me, our 21st century Roosevelt moment to bring about seismic changes in people's lives and make the United States more equitable and just. Environmental justice and climate impact communities must be included in the just transition to a renewable and environmental remediation economy. No longer should we, should we be left out of jobs that lead to economic security and a better quality of life. Excuse my voice. <clears throat> this transition will require large investments in education that includes job skills training and wraparound services. I think that the development of programs designed to reach these goals represent great opportunities to do more than recognize inequity and injustice, but work to remedy the problem. I believe that that I believe the parable, and I've taken some license with it. If you give a person a fish, that person eats for a day. If you teach a person to fish, a household and community will eat for a lifetime. 
There are many areas where Justice 40 can transform lives, but I want to uplift the NIHS Environmental Career Worker Training Program, which has impacted the lives of more than 17,000 and counting unemployed and underemployed people in environmental justice and climate impacted communities. These programs present occasions for collaboration between the community and government that can lead to building trust because people almost immediately gain marketable skills and a livelihood that improves their quality of life. So I'm hoping that this is just one example of what Justice for These Monies can do to give people a hand up, not a handout, a hand up on changing their lives. Beverly, thank you. Thank you for bringing the focus back so squarely to dignity and, and justice and opportunity in the most fundamental terms. Yoka, your final thoughts. Well, it's hard to top Dr. Wright, um, but I'll try my best. I, I, I just wanna, first of all, you know, thank Cecilia and, and Mark and, and Dr. Wright and, and everybody here today. Um, we are, facing a, a really remarkable, unprecedented moment. Right now, what's happening at, at, you know, at the Capitol and will be happening at COP26 in the upcoming days, it's truly a, a sunset opportunity for us to, to really build the future that we all envision. Um, I welcome the, 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 the invitation for interacting with local communities and, and for communities on the ground, vulnerable communities, and, and all of us working on, on the front lines. I think that is truly necessary. So I just wanna say from Miami here in Ground Zero, please reach out, give us a call. Um, and I, again, you know, Godspeed and thank you all for your you know, hard work. Uh, we were counting on all of you. Thank you so much. Yoka, thank you. Thanks to all of our panelists. Thanks to everyone who tuned in and all of the co-sponsors today for making this possible. We appreciate it. We appreciate you and we see you and what you're doing. And as a final note to Mark and Cecilia, I know the community is really eager for any sort of preview you can give us. I won't ask you for top lines right now. We're at time. But uh, any preview about how you'd like engagement to work, you know, going forward and kind of what to expect next, uh, we'd be happy to pass that information along and to see that it gets distributed very widely. Again, thanks to all of you uh, for today. Uh, everyone stay safe and take care. This conversation is very much to be continued. Thank you, everybody.